Hello, personal wealth management students, Dr. Robinson. Um, we are going to start a new topic today on risk management. So, um, and welcome to the new delivery method of um, this class. So, uh, it's from interesting times, right? Lots of, lots of new developments the world over. Um, but, all right, so this is a perfect time to be talking about risk management as a topic because suddenly there's all sorts of risks that we're experiencing that maybe we never thought we would. So what's the big picture here? So we want to understand the theory behind risk management and the process. And at the end of the day, or so in, in, in practical terms, what are we doing? We're trying to take care of lots of different kinds of negative events that people's lives can experience and smooth out the outcomes. Naturally, this means a heavily a discussion of insurance, although that's not the only method of risk management, um, but it's going to be an, a very important one. So we'll talk about um, insurance products that are useful for regular folks as part of this chapter, um, and including a, right, a list of all the different types and uh, right so our goals are really to be able to use the household the total portfolio management approach when we're thinking about risk management um, incorporating all the different risks and all the financial assets of the family together into a big package and think about how they all interact right so uh, the, the employment income of a family and the financial assets of a family, when combined, might affect the insurance products that are appropriate for them. And that's um, where a, a, just a, a monolith, just like a focus just on one thing that doesn't capture, right? So um, really, if you're doing your job right, you're going to be thinking about all the different aspects of, um, of their you know, personal portfolio, including human capital, financial capital, expected expenditures, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so risk management in theory, right, can be viewed as the study of methods for controlling portfolio risk, right? We're controlling the risk in a portfolio and among all the different dimensions. And, um, and so first that's going to, the management of risk is going to depend on the, um, to risk tolerance of the people you're working with, right? So, um, if, if we have a high risk tolerance, then we might need to manage risk to a larger level, right? We'll have more risk still there than folks that are really happy to pay a lot of money to eliminate a lot more risk, right? So that's kind of the trade-off is that risk management um, costs, right? If you don't like, if you're getting rid of something you don't like, someone else is getting it and they're going to charge, charge you for that. So there's um, a trade-off there. Some folks are willing to pay more for risk management and some folks are willing to pay less. So you have to kind of fill them out and make recommendations based on what their personal risk tolerances are, right? In general, some important um, products with negative correlation are costly. So uh, because things that move opposite market movements can be used as a hedge against things that have market movement. So if I say buy a broad based stock market index but then I purchase uh, an insurance policy on that index, well, I can only go up, right? The only thing I can do from that point is make money. And that's a really valuable position. People really like that. And so that means that insurance products that completely eliminate the downside risk from volatile stocks are going to be um, quite expensive because people won't want to take the downside of stocks with no upside without a lot of fees. Whereas, you know, the downside risk from a one month loan to the federal government is maybe cheaper, right? So um, depending on the nature of the financial asset or the, or the asset in general, um, but regardless, right, regardless, if it's an, if it has a negative correlation with the market broadly, it's going to be very expensive because it will cancel risk in the things that people are typically invested in. Um, so, uh, Right, the, the the book notes that there are there's no real way to l eliminate risk entirely, and in particular, it's very tough to hedge risk in human capital. Right, so your 
getting a an, an education in finance, you'll graduate with bachelor's degrees in finance from Viterbo, and that is a useful skill that has financial value. But the the amount of value of that degree um, depends on a lot of outside factors, and trying to you know quote unquote ensure that value is very tricky, right? What even would that look like? How do you ensure the value of your um, of your bachelor's degree. It's, it's very hard, right? So it's a lot easier to ensure something like your house catching fire. You just collect a check when your house catches fire. But um, but there are there are developments along this front, right? So uh, for example, a lot of um, newer uh, they're call, you know, they're calling them modern universities, but these are um, uh, newly launched educational programs where rather than paying tuition, you pay a percentage of your income increase upon graduation. And, uh, and so that in effect is an insurance policy against your degree not being worth very much. And it also means that then the, ins- the uh, university is invested in you getting a good career and in you selecting programs of study that are ultimately lucrative. So, um, that puts the responsibility for choosing good human capital investments on the university rather than on the individual. So it's an interesting development. This is just in the last couple of years this has happened. Um, and that, in a way, means that now we have um, human capital hedges that are better than we did in the past, but they're still not great. Um, uh, similarly, right, you can have um, human risks like unemployment and health challenges, and health insurance helps you offset the cost of health care, and unemployment benefits can help offset the cost of losing your job, but they're by no means restorative, right? So if you collect unemployment, you get some money, but it's, um, at least in the United States, nothing close to what you were making before. And health insurance pays medical bills, but it doesn't pay lost quality of life. It doesn't pay lost work hours, right? All those things are um, still, uh, so right, it, it's, so point is it's still really disappointing in the United States to get laid off or to be long-term sick. Um, and so there's lots of limits to what we can do, but just because we're limited doesn't mean we don't want to do what we can. So that's really where this comes from. Um, there's lots of different ways to modify a household's portfolio risk. Insurance products are many of them, but, there's, but there are others. Um, so the idea here, right, is to make a risk of the portfolio match the tolerance for the, the, the risk tolerance of your clients and then come up with a strategy that makes that happen. So um, so what does that mean in practical terms? It means thinking about potential losses that are of concern to your clients and then finding ways to mitigate those losses with some kind of um, strategy, right? A portfolio management strategy. So uh, for risk management, there's according to your text, there's six stages. So first, what are the objectives, right? What are the risks that we're concerned about? Establish, second, establish the exposure. So where, where what kind of things can be affected by these negative outcomes, right? So if, let's say I have a serious concern about um, having, maybe I have a family history of stroke, right? And so I might have a debilitating stroke that um, I'm alive, but I need um, constant medical care and I will have difficulty completing my current line of work. Well, in that circumstance, right there, we wanna imagine, well, first of all, my earnings potential is gone, so I'd wanna have some kind of long-term disability insurance for sure. Also, I'd have some pretty serious health outcomes, so I'd want some some health care. I also might need to uh, relocate, right? So I might want to have um, a, a save, saving set aside for um, for moving and for short term expenses during the transition period, and um, and right and then maybe think about other kind of things that we could do to prepare for that eventuality. Um, now maybe other clients aren't worried about that at all. So it just kind of depends on um, what losses they are interested in protecting themselves from, and also of course your role as well as their advisor is to help them identify things maybe they weren't thinking about that they should be. And um, 
And so every household is different in this way. So they need a, a custom sort of identification of the risks relevant and then apply um, risk management tools to try to mitigate those risks going forward. So there's, um, right, according to the book, at least eight different methods. So um, with stroke, avoiding it, right, so okay, first is avoid it. That doesn't really work so great for stroke. But you can imagine, for example, having a, um, if you do uh, base jumping, right, fun, exciting, uh, it carries quite a bit of personal risk, especially if you're doing wingsuits over like mountains, right? That lots of people die doing that. And so, um, if we want to, that's a pretty serious risk. One thing we do is just stop doing that, right? It seems obvious, but avoiding it, it can apply to a lot of different things, right? If you do lots of overseas travel that has inherently some risk that you can eliminate by not doing it, um, uh, right, so uh, there's a lot. Right, rec, uh, so there are addictive recreational drugs that you, are would pose a serious risk financially, and to the success of a family that can be done just by right. right. So avoiding it, just not doing it, as we done, could could help reducing the risk. So maybe just reduce the amount that we're doing these things. Um, reduce potential loss. So how can we lessen the damage if a loss occurs? So, um, for example, maybe. Right, so this is where uh, some insurance products could come in. Right, if I have a fire, that's a big loss, but I could reduce that loss if I have a, fi a cash payout from my um, from my property destruction. But there's other ways. Maybe you can, um, uh, maybe the activity could change to reduce the potential loss. Um, so retaining the risk. So this is a management strategy where you just keep it. So we're still going to do. Or, I mean, that whatever that risk is, let's say unemployment risk. So we're going to retain unemployment risk. We're not trying to hedge it in any way. Um, but then um, we have to like plan ahead to absorb that loss ourselves. So we might not have an insurance necessarily, but we might have savings to offset that outcome. All right, diversify. So if we have a diversified portfolio of risks, then we might be, you know, we might experience them, but on a whole, they might, you know, sort of average out instead of like having big risks. So, um, you know, for example, right. So if I have a, like a single income family that puts a lot of, um, a lot of financial eggs in one basket, but if you have a two earner family, then if one partner loses their job, then the other one is still going. So it ends up being sort of workforce participation diversification um, but of course can apply to a lot of different things i'm um, transfer the risk transfer the risk to somebody else so if there's someone else that's willing to bear it you see this for example in co-signers with loans right if you want to buy a car but you don't you look too risky from the bank's perspective maybe you get uh you know a rich uncle to co-sign on the loan and then they put their good name on the line for you and then hopefully you live up to it right so this is a way of transferring risk from a riskier party to a safer party i'm sharing so in effect insurance health insurance bulls work like this or we all pay in and then some people use more of it than others and it's just kind of random you don't know which and so um you just um work with it like that and uh then there's financial methods, so future swaps. Um, for example, if you are working overseas, collecting overseas currency, you might um, hedge that currency risk for when you come back to the States. Um, if you have a portfolio of stocks, you could insure it with a with an out-of-the-money put option. Right? So there's lots of different financial methods that can approach this as well. So we've got all these different methods, so we match the method to the exposure, right? So if, if base jumping is a major risk in my life, one method would be to buy life insurance. Another method is to stop base jumping, right? So different approaches for different risks. And so we'll look at some different categories and see how we could, what different um, risk management strategies would be appropriate. So first we'll start with human related assets. So this is um, the couple, right? Two major ones, this has to do with life, dying early or dying late. And if you die early, you might not be able to provide for your family. And so that would mean that that could you know cause some serious problems because you're still in a position of being the, uh, you know, a, 
uh, supporter of dependence. And then the opposite is living too long. So if you live beyond the capacity of your savings, you'll have um, an extreme reduction in standard of living and it could be very unpleasant. So it's, you can have bit risk on both sides, but they're approached differently, right? So if I'm worried about dying early and leaving my family in a bad spot, the general solution for that is a life insurance product, right? A life insurance product works, works really well for this particular problem. Life insurance does not help with the living too long problem. In fact, it's the opposite. Life insurance would exacerbate this and that now you have cash flow leaving the system to pay for a life insurance that you're not collecting on until much, much later when you don't even really need it, right? So um, longevity is solved differently, right? So if we're worried about living too long, this is where we up our savings amounts, um, maybe invest in annuities that we collect while we're alive rather than um, life insurance policies that collect after we die, right? So different problems require different risk management strategies uh, and um, in terms of insurance, different insurance products. Um, health and disability. So um, health insurance matters a lot, but and disability, there's disability insurance as well. Um, macro and microeconomic risk. So if there's risk in the inherent in the general economy, um, that can be, right, so general macroeconomic risk can be insured using, um, or, or at least partly insured using broad uh, market indice based products, right? So if you get an insurance, right, if you if you insure yourself uh, against the broad stock market index, that can broadly work to help your life. If, for example, we have a recession and your job, let's say you work in sales and your um, you, you have a bonus, right, and your bonus tends to disappear in recessions, well, that would mean that your bonus disappeared, but your insurance policy, right, your 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 option that you purchased on a broad stock market index will then be paying out large amounts of money, right? So your bonus disappeared, but your financial stuff kicked in, right? And when your bonus is good, you're, you know, not making anything or perhaps even losing on that financial part, right? So if you are personally exposed to the macro economy, macroeconomic insurance products can offset or macroeconomic risk management solutions can offset that. Um, microeconomics is a little bit trickier, right? So if you if your particular company or that particular industry struggles, makes you struggle, now it's a little bit harder, but but you can still try to find ways to offset, you know, things that do well when that microeconomic outcome is poor would then serve as an insurance, effectively insurance. Um, precautionary savings is an example that sort of works like that, right? So if you if, if the economy is fine, but your firm does poorly, having savings set aside it, it, it is, is a way to um, help with that a little bit. Um, so there are, it's not just, right, so in addition to job income, right, so in addition to the money you make from your job, there are other assets that have risk. So, um, uh, so if, I mean, obviously any, you know, getting married and having children with someone is uh it is is risky in that if it goes poorly and you end up in a divorce and um are trying to raise children shared between people that don't necessarily like each other right that's that's a big risk and so um how can we mitigate that well maybe you know so maybe you think about investing for the purposes of risk mitigation like investing in the relationship or um that kind of thing so that's you know a very different sort of thinking about all of this uh, and gets a little abstract but the the notion is that it's more right this is more than just um offering people insurance products right which is where you know which is where it kind of goes first but it's really much beyond that um so Real assets, houses and cars are a great example, and we insure houses and we insure cars, but there can be other ones, right? So um, you can get a personal liability umbrella um, to protect um, right, things not covered by your, um, by your, by your home and po homeowner's policy or your auto policy, right? There's boat insurance and motorcycle insurance. Um, and you can get a personal policy for, um, 
for large value items, right? So if you have, uh, I mean, let's say you have a classic car, you don't drive, but you want to insure it against theft or damage, then, then that would be well, a separate sort of policy, but those exist. Uh, you know, so um, I, I was, for the last year, it's, I'm, I'm done now, but for the last year, I was the treasurer for uh, the, the Central High School Show Choir, and um, and there are, you can insure your um, your uh, competition, right? So if you you know a lot of show choirs depend on hosting a competition for revenue to pay um, to pay bills, and you can get insurance products for that through Lloyd's of London. Um, so uh, other things, so real assets, real assets can be at risk. Financial assets can be at risk. So if you, I, right, uh, we have a large portfolio of stocks we can think about managing the risk of those and liabilities have risk too so um if we have uh so if, you know if we have outstanding revolving like credit card debt that is a liability and those liabilities can carry risk themselves so um for example if we go through a significant inflation the insurance rates on those cards might balloon but they also uh, might become easier to pay off if you have corresponding wage inflation. So, um, so financial assets and financial liabilities both have risks for themselves. Um, intangible liabilities, um, lots of things can be a liability that's in your life that you want to risk manage, uh, right? So, okay, so care of personal property, right? Maybe you have. Um, right, someone's got to mow the lawn and shovel the walks and stuff. And if you're injured, you may not be able to do that. So that's a, you know, and, and, and health insurance is not going to cover sidewalk shoveling. So does you think separately about that? Um, I mentioned umbrellas or cover a type lawsuits, right? So, um, if somebody slips on your walk because you couldn't shovel because you were hurt and sues you, then, um, you can have insurance to protect you from that. A professional liability is really important in some professions. I think um, uh, attorneys in particular or um, medical professionals tend to carry this, right? Where, you know, whereas other professions don't really worry too much about professional liability and don't necessarily need it. Um, so uh, knowing what these different risks are can be um, really useful and all and I guess so. That's that fourth bullet, and then lastly, if we main the uh, main expense expenses for things, can be thought of as a as an obligation and an intangible liability. So so let's say I have a timeshare, right? I don't have I own it. I don't have any debt on it, but I have to pay maintenance fees every year. So that be, that becomes a liability on its own in a way. Um, or let's you know, so let's say I have a nice boat, and it's paid for. But it needs to go into winter storage, and that's some money I have to pay no matter what. So these are all, uh, in this case, financial risks, but um, but they'll they can show up. So we figure out what we want to do based on all the different things we're exposed to, come up with a plan, and then implement the plan. So take a, taking action, right? So we're going to stop base jumping, we're going to buy health insurance, and we're going to set aside savings in in case of a job loss, and we're going to. Um, get some broad-based market insurance, so a, you know a long-term um, put option on the broad index to lower the risk of our overall financial portfolio. Maybe maybe that's our plan. Then we go implement and we do all those things, and then, like any good plan, you have to go back and review. So, and as risk change or amount of risk changes or the type of risk change, then you have to revisit. Right? So, um, so yeah, those are the six major steps. And one, and you'll and right, this keeps coming up over and over again. Insurance is a major way in which we manage risk. Um, and the idea is to transfer it. And the, insurance works best, right, when you have a very difficult, large personal risk that becomes very boring when aggregated, right? So house fires are devastating for individuals, and as collections of individuals, they're boring, right? So okay. You know, we're going to have two houses burned down every day, but if it's two every day, it's just a steady stream of outgo, and we have a steady stream of income from the premiums, and so it becomes very boring. Or obviously, uh, you know, but you can imagine how this could be different in like a flood, right? If Houston floods, now you have all these houses breaking out at once, but, um, 
you have all these houses breaking out once, but uh, most homeowners policies don't cover flood for that exact reason. They tend to happen in clumps, so it's a bad thing to be insuring, whereas fires aren't so bad. Um, so for insurance to be effective, the, the insuring company wants to have the premiums equal the expenses that pay out plus a little extra. In, in, um, in life insurance, it's actually even... Um, the, the premiums tend to be significantly smaller than what's paid out, but what's paid out is so far in the future, they can make up a lot of money in the interim, right? So the investment income ends up paying um, the, 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 even though they're paying out more than they're taking in, they still end up making a lot of money because they have a long time to invest it. Um, that's not true for property casualty, right? So you insure a car, you might crash it next week, right? So the money leaving for insuring cars and boats and houses is right away and so the premiums come in they they go out and it it's kind of constant but life insurance works differently so um there's a couple problems with making the insurance work market work in general so there's overhead where you have to manage all of the employees to mail out the letters and collect the money and everything um we also have a couple major things with well first moral hazard and adverse selection so moral hazard is um, because I have the insurance, now I behave differently, right? So we can think, okay, I have really great health care, really great health insurance. Um, I'm in a base jump because I'm, I'm good, right? I, 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 I am more likely to do risky health behaviors because my insurance is really good, perhaps. So that's moral hazard where people choose to behave differently because of their insurance. Um, adverse selection is different. Adverse selection is... I, I was already a risk for doing this, and I know this, and so I've chosen to um, insure myself because I'm a risk. Um, there was a, there was an insurance um, company in, when I was I went to school in Utah. There was an insurance company that was selling. I think I don't think the company itself knew this was going on, but the the brokers did. They said, "Hey, if you're newly married and, ex and and think you might be expecting a baby in the near future um there's an insurance product that will pay you money w once you have your baby right but the idea was that you would get the product and then you'll have a baby and the people getting the product knew they were having a baby or were likely to have a baby in the future right so in general you might say oh well 22 year old college students are not really very likely to be to be pregnant but um the the population of people buying this policy were much more likely to be expecting a baby than the population at large right so that's adverse selection at work the people choosing to get the policy are different than the people not choosing to get the policy so that's always something insurers are trying to think about right why do you want full liability coverage on your junky old car what's going on um those are those are major ones. Search, okay, so search costs costs that a, the person desiring to be insured. Sorry, so you take some work to find the right policy. So that right, that's that's a time cost, but it's you know someone has to bear it. Usually the person looking, and then um, and also right there's just the the behavioral factor of we're not always like rational when it comes to managing risk and we overweight low probability events and or or ignore them entirely um so types of policies for for um, I, I mentioned these right so life pays upon death disability pays upon disability long-term care pays when you are alive but in like a nursing home or a resident or residential care facility that helps pay those um those costs and then um health insurance we're familiar with and then that's personal and then property we have property and casualty so this is homes and possessions where right? renters insurance falls under this and then personal liability so this is um liabilities of lots of different personal things so again you, you get sued for example or um or um cause you know cause damage somewhere um right those are personal and property. A uh, government has its own insurance, right? Unemployment insurance um, is the government um, does this, and then we have um, the uh, the Social Security. Is, it effectively provides um, insurance for 
um, older adults, right? So it's an, an, an income insurance. It's just, I mean, it's savings, but it's a way to ensure yourself against your inability to um, have a good, strong career in older age. And then there are other products too. So we have, um, uh, so the, a lot of the social, we call it social insurance, things like welfare, food stamps, um, low income medical insurance like Medicaid, um, in, in the, in Wisconsin, right, we have a benefit where you can go get help with your heating bill. I never, right. That was not something ever like, noticed in California, but right here, it actually matters because it's dangerous to live in a home with no heat. And so we have insurance to help if, you know, if you're in a really bad spot, we'll, you know, the, the state will step in and help you with that. Um, and then the, we also have, um, long-term disability, lots of, and through the government, the SS, SSDI. So there's lots of different um, types of insurance, and there's different providers. The government is a provider, private um, group policies, and private individual policy. Group policy is, you know, so my health insurance, for example, is a Viterbo group policy. So all of us together are in an insurance pool, and that's different from, say, if I was working on my own and I was trying to get insurance by myself. That was actually very difficult, and that was part of what, the Affordable Care Act was meant to address was to provide a way for individuals to purchase um, individual insurance on a marketplace. Um, so uh, picking an insurance company, there's lots of different factors to think about of uh, the how financial strength. So you can, are there bonds rated highly? Do they have good operating sense? If you look at the financial ratios of the firm, do they appear to be in a, st a stable strong operating position um do people or service do people have good experiences working with this company um do they have the uh, really good prices um and for uh, in my in in my world i have a lot of my stuff through state farm and part of the reason for that is my great my uh my let's see how, what what this is like a uh a, a, a First cousin twice removed, maybe? I, was, I mean, it's a, uh, fellows in my family, and we've known each other for years, and so I feel a lot more comfortable um, seeking out help from my insurance agent because um, because we're, we're related and I have, like, a good relationship with them. And so that actually matters a lot to me. Um, and I, you know, and I think State Farm generally has good prices, but um, the, the service I get means a lot. So... Um, so there's lots of factors to think about when you're um, considering recommending an insurance product to a client. Insurance um, is a financial asset, right? It it um, it consumes money when you pay the premiums and then potentially pays off. And when in in terms of life insurance, with with whole life, we'll get to in a second. Whole life, you're um, definitely getting that payment. You, you know, it's going to be at the end of your life, and your life will end. And so as long as you make those payments consistently. Um, over the life of the um, of the insurance product, you will um, be collecting, and so if, if they are right in effect, you're outsourcing an investment function to another company, um, and then doing some risk pooling, risk sharing. So, um, so there's and and um, so in, in a way, you can think about it as a financial asset in with your other financial assets in your portfolio. Um, right. So there's lots of, we, we, we're talking about insurance, but there's the other ways to manage all these things too. Right. So health insurance, health, well, health itself is a risk. Insurance does some, but of course, diet, exercise, stress management, those help too. Um, illness, right. Living a, uh, right. Living a healthy life or in social distancing when we're in the middle of pandemics, um, help, but also medical insurance. Right. Um, Early death, right? You can the life insurance helps offset that, but also eating well, exercising, um, avoiding alcohol and cigarettes, right? All all the, these things that contribute to accidents and early death or cancer, la la la. Don't do that. You won't, you're less likely to die early, and you get cheaper insurance rates. And then, of which you know could then feed into the extra long life concerns. And then you might need to save more, right? If you say, "Oh, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I have, I'm healthy, I exercise a lot," I should be really careful and make sure I have enough savings because I might be living longer than everybody else, right? So, um, 
they they're there so there are financial insurance products to get but then also lifestyle changes that manage this as well um so right there's more in there but um you don't need to talk about every last one of them uh, so this is or this is interesting inflation right if you're worried about inflation um there are you can get inflation index bonds for example uh, that's they're called tips treasury inflation protected securities um or right like it's, you can use my solution i have some canned food in my basement so i have like cans of i mean i don't i'm not that worried about inflation but if suddenly food got way expensive maybe i might stop buying it from the grocery store and get it from my basement for a little while until things calm down or i got a raise I mean, who knows, right? But there's point is to get a little, you can be a little creative when thinking about how to address some of these risks. Um, so life insurance has, uh, is, is one particular kind of insurance that we talked about before with managing. Um, basically, it's, it's useful for managing early death, right? It pays upon death. Um, it, it works in concert with disability insurance and un unemployment insurance, in that it's a human asset risk, right? You're, you're trying, you want a life insurance payment because your value as a wage earner gets destroyed when you die. And that might be a shock to the financial system of your family. And so we want to protect against that using life insurance. Um, so there's different parts of insurance policy. Uh, so we, um, we have uh, the right the the payment upon mortality. We have the returns they get from the premiums they've invested, and then how much overhead they have, how much expense they have. So, for example, Geico um, is they run a lot of ads, which are expensive, but they don't do um, they don't have offices with people you go visit. Right, it's all sold direct over the phone or over the internet. So they have so that really helps on overhead. So it's an example of where overhead can be different between different insurers. Um, so how much insurance do we need? Uh, it kind of really depends on um, the this right the needs of the family. But one one method is to think about income replacement, right? So how much income did the family have? How long do they need to be able to live? Um, so for example, if you have a family with young children, you might want to have enough life insurance so that the the surviving spouse or partner could work could um parent for maybe three to five years um until daycare is a reasonable option and uh, um and so you would need an insurance amount significantly larger than income whereas if maybe you have um right so it just sort of depends on the situation um whereas maybe if you have a non-earning spouse um then you would want to figure out how much um Right, child care would be in in their absence. So um, lots of different ways to think about what you want to be replacing with insurance. And um, that can affect, right, and again, the bigger the premium, the bigger the benefit, the bigger the premiums. Um, so uh, things to factor in, right? If you have a smaller household, you're gonna have a decline in living costs, or maybe they could down, you could plan on downsizing a house maybe if you have, um, in the case of a sudden death, uh, future education costs of children, right? So maybe your expenses are what they are right now, but they might go up as kids approach college age. Um, maybe you can plan on repaying the mortgage with the insurance proceeds to help the cash flow situation. So, um, so that's right. So that's one approach or other, other way is to maybe only shoot for a modest lifestyle. So you would plan for reducing lifestyle. And that can save a little money in the short term. Um, so, so that affects the benefit we're searching for. Now, there's a couple different ways to get it. Um, term insurance is the most popular version. Um, term insurance is life insurance that's um, the benefit is consistent over a particular period. Usually, I mean, for the young, 20 years or so. So again, whole life lasts your entire life. So that's why it's so expensive. You're making payments, the same payments your entire life and then you get a big benefit at the end. Term insurance, you know, so I have a term policy. I got it when I was 22. Um, and so it is, um, and we and then we re-upped it, um, I think when I was 26, 27. And so um, I'm getting to where, 
uh, right? So I'm I'm currently 39. Um, at some point, that term is going to have to expire. It is going to expire, and I will have to re up my term insurance now as a 47 year old instead of a 27 year old. That means I will have a pretty significantly right. My premiums are going to go way up at that point. And what what that means also is I will probably reduce my payout significantly because at 47, I will have, I mean, my last kids will still be in the house, but they'll be in high school probably. And so, um, I mean, who knows, right? But the, uh, so that means the, the amount that I need would be different. So, um, so term insurance lasts for only a particular term. That means it's quite a bit cheaper because you're not, um, you're not insuring somebody really old. It's you're only maybe insuring during low mortality periods, so it can be quite a bit cheaper. Um, um, so renewable term lets you renew regardless of health, right? So that um, that's important. And then convertible term allows you to swap into a whole life policy. And so these are all little um riders that you can that you know the different policies have you then you pay different amounts to get these features um but in general uh, people tend to have term term policies and then let them expire without using them um and that's okay right it's served in a certain function and then it's done um whole life is different so whole life so this is an example of what premiums would look like, right? So for whole life, you pay a flat premium over the entire life. And so you pay quite a bit more from age 22 to age, oh, you know, here in this example, 46. You're paying more through your almost entire working life. But then you can see this dramatically cheaper as you enter older ages, right? And basically, yeah, insurance products for people in their 60s and 70s are incredibly expensive if you don't have whole life. Um, and so that's and that's and, and how can these level payments exist well because this money that was paid in way back in the aged ages 20s and 30s was invested in this paying out so um so the idea with whole life is you set aside quite a bit of money at the first you may do a big premium and then um, over time, you um, are going to pay less and less than you would have otherwise. This gives whole life a cash value. They actually will um, calculate cash value and a surrender value for you. So you can get to where you're saving a bunch of money and just take the money out instead of using it for its purpose. This generally is a terrible investing decision, but in you know if there's a financial emergency that's worth it, very few are, but if there were one, it could be used. A universal life is um, it's it's a it's a little like whole life. What's different is that if you can put extra money in to a universal life policy, and then they will invest it for you, and then later you can use the um, savings component to make the premiums. And, and so you could do universal life on a term as well, right? So the term policy is really cheap. You you pay a bunch of money anyway. You've got a big savings component, and then when you're in your 50s and 60s and the premiums are insane, you start drawing down the savings component of the universal life policy. So um, it's a way to basically tack an, a, almost like a brokerage account onto an insurance a, an insurance product so that they can like talk to each other. Um, it, it exists. I mean, there there's – and sometimes there's some efficiency from just being able to only look in one place. A variable life allows you to dictate where your investments are are put, right? So if I, right, so if I have my premiums and I say, oh, put this in this risky stuff, then maybe my returns will be higher and I'll have a bigger benefit later in life, or maybe my premiums could reduce later because I was aggressive in my investments. Um, and you can actually combine the two, right? So you can do a universal variable life where you where you choose to invest more in your insurance policy, choose to put it in the stock market, and then the savings will co component will grow hopefully faster because you are in a riskier asset. Right? So there's lots of different, um, lots of different versions, but the reality is for most people, a term policy without any bells and whistles is usually going to be the right thing to do. But there could be exceptions. Okay. Um, so again, the big there's term compared to whole. The big so big advantage of term is that the premiums are smaller 
And that matters a lot because the people, right, you saw you're saving money in your 20s and 30s. So that tends to be a pretty significant cash crunch for people. I mean, it depends how you run your life, um, right? You, I mean, mine, I had kids early, married early. We had pretty serious financial commitments early. And so having a term policy was really nice, especially since we had to do large amounts, right? I had to have a big benefit because if I, if I had an untimely death, after I had five kids, well, that's right. It takes a lot of financial resources to support a family of six or nine. Um, and so uh, so that would mean, so term was really good and that the premiums were affordable during a time when I didn't have a lot of cash flow. Now, later in life, right, when I'm more closer to retirement age, it, I will have the non-benefit of basically not having insurance at all, right? Or paying a lot of money for insurance in the future. So that means I have to plan financially for once I, you know, and so I will probably um, do another term policy at 47. So at 67, maybe I don't have any insurance at all and I just depend on social security and whatever savings I've accrued, right? So, um, so that's the really the weakness over term is that there's no forced savings component and at the end of life then you can be stuck with literally no affordable insurance at all, right? Whole then is the exact opposite, right? It forces savings early. You um, are you have this like benefit, so no matter what, you know that your estate will have a large financial payout that you saved over time, and so and your so your family will always be taken care of in, a, in the amount of the whole insurance as long as you make the premiums. And so um, that can be valuable. Um, so, but the, yeah, and again, the big weakness is just, it's a lot of money early on. I mean, the, the premiums are four times larger if you're in your early 20s. And, uh, and so, uh, and so that, that, that's, that's really the trade off, right? It's, it's just a savings motive versus a, an insurance motive. And depending on the financial status of your clients, different, approaches can be appropriate right so oh, there's lots of different factors right how how long do you, are you going to hold it um are, if we don't do whole life are we going to invest or are we just going to spend it right if your clients are just going to spend the money whole life would be better because it will force them to contribute to um to this um bequest at the end and so it really you just have to know your client situation to know best um, and that's that's really the end of the of insurance. So there's we we went through some major some major products. Um, talked about insuring right that there's lots of different exposures that can be approached in lots of different ways. Um, but major ones that you as an advisor will be helping people navigate will be life insurance, property casualty insurance, personal liability insurance, and then um, understanding and knowing how to navigate government programs in case they run into financial trouble. So, um, so that's our lesson on an insurance. I will um, post it and then check in with you next week.